Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is retired Marine Corps General Walt Boomer. Sir, thank you very much for being with us. You're very welcome. Let's start where we always like to begin. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in a little town in northeastern North Carolina called Rich Square, a town of about a thousand people. I don't think it's grown any since I left there years and years ago. And where did you go to school? Because I know ROTC is how you ultimately joined the service, correct? Yeah. I went uh, to Duke University, uh, became involved in the Naval ROTC. Uh, my mother's dream for me was to be a Navy officer. She was from Norfolk, Virginia. So that was sort of the epitome in her eyes. And uh, I got to Duke and I looked around that unit and um, year two I switched to the Marine Corps. And I, I didn't tell her what I was doing and she was a real force in my life. But I came home and I said, Mom, uh, I'm not going to the Navy. She said, oh, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to the Marine Corps. And I'll never forget, it's so clear to me now, years later, she said, over my dead body and stalked out of the room. Well, I, she passed away very early, but she came to realize that that was a good decision for me. Uh, but that was sort of my entree into, into the Marine Corps via Duke. Why did you ultimately make that switch? Talk about that a little more. Well, I, I looked at the people that were there in this ROTC unit, and I really admired the gunnery sergeant, the Marine gunnery sergeant, and uh, I admired the major that was there. They seemed to sort of epitomize uh, what was good about the military to me. It just resonated, and I had a couple of friends that had already made that decision, and. You know, we're influenced by our friends if we respect them. And it just came together like that. So we're in the early 1960s at this point. Yes. So upon graduation, where did you go after that? Uh, upon graduation, of course, to basic school, which all Marine officers go for six months. And from basic school to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, as a platoon commander. Uh, and that was my first tour of duty. In, in North Carolina, and an interesting tour. In Guantanamo twice, there during the missile crisis, and before, uh, in and out of the Caribbean, and uh, a, a very great learning experience for me. I had good leadership that I came to admire, and it was during that period of time in which I needed to make a decision about whether or not I was going to stay in the Marine Corps or just serve my obligation. And <laughs> the Marine Corps came to me and said, we would like to offer you a regular commission. And looking back now, it seems a little arrogant on my part, but I really wasn't sure. And I said, no, I don't think so. I'm going to test this out a while longer. Well, in today's times, if you're offered that commission and don't accept it, I don't think it's offered again. But at any rate, I. I, I did grow to really like what I was doing and my colleagues. And I went back and said, if you'll offer me that commission, I'll accept it. And they did. Uh, but I really had never intended to stay, uh, but ultimately did. <laughs> ultimately, the Vietnam War, of course, yeah. escalates in the 1960s. Your first tour. Uh, there was an incident in which you earned a silver star. It was February of 1967. Right. Explain what happened that day. We, we were doing our usual thing of trying to fix and locate the enemy, when in fact they had already fixed and located us because as I look back on the tactics, I, I'm not really too, too proud of them, but nevertheless, my company was moving along with the rest of the battalion and we were going into a territory that had been long contested um, by the North Vietnamese assisting the, the regular Viet Cong forces. So <clears throat> we had telegraphed our, our movement. You know, we, we just couldn't help but do that. And they, uh, they created a huge, uh, probably multi-battalion ambush and 
we did some things correctly. Our, our point, the point of my company, those who were out in front, tripped this ambush before the rest of the body of the company got into it. Um, and they really saved a lot of lives that day. Two of those Marines were killed. At, at any rate, then we were extremely close. They began to attack. And interestingly enough, the artillery battalion that was supporting us was in front of us, not behind. That was commanded by a friend of mine uh, named uh, Al Barry. And he began to provide artillery support for us. So we called it in to us. Um, ultimately close, so close that he said, I'm not going to do it. And I said, yes, you are. So he did. We broke, we broke the back of, of, of the ambush. Um, and the rest is history. We survived. A lot of them did not, but it was a, it was a close call. How did your leadership training kick in in that moment? Because your Silver Star citation talks about how you not only risked your life to get closer to the enemy and observe, but also when units came in, you were the one who knew the terrain and you kind of coordinated all these different units together to, to effectively repulse this ambush. You know, in, in combat, it, it's, it's, uh, it's chaotic. And uh, if I read that citation myself today, I would say, really? <laughs> <laughs> you, you react to the situation and keep your fear under control to the extent that you can um, and try to keep a level head. Um, and you also, um, you, you need to lead from the front. And I have believed that all of my career. So I had positioned myself when the attack began up very close behind the first platoon that was engaged. And, and from there you could operate, I could operate and see what was going on. And yes, managed to, to help the battalion coordinate uh, their movement so that we began to cut these guys off. So but, then, go ahead. Um, that sort of seems to be the extent of it. <laughs> you, know, it you, you, you know, Greg, you do what you need to do and you, you do what you've been trained to do. And I think that's where all of these, all of these hours of training begins to, to kick in and some of it becomes pretty, pretty automatic, hopefully, mm -hmm. like muscle memory or mind memory. It, it, begins to kick in. So then after the first tour, you come yeah. back stateside for a number of years. Right. And get a pretty good job uh, being an aide de camp to one of the top generals, correct? Yeah. What was that experience like? Um, a great experience. Uh, I was the aide to a general, Lieutenant General Theron, and I learned a lot from him. General Theron had been captured on Wake Island in a prison of war for most of the war of the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And he was unflappable. And, and I, you know, he never talked about that experience and I was a little too shy about it to really ask him. I wish I had now asked him more about that, but my feeling was he would think, you know, I survived all that. The, this little crisis that we're having today is not, not very much in the scheme of, of life. So calm, so cool. Um, as were all the general officers that I became associated with and, and worked for. I, they all had a little different style, um, but all, all were good men. Then you went back to Vietnam for a second tour in the yeah, early 70s, right? I went back to Vietnam. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, my monitor, who was the personnel assignment guy, who was of the same rank 
as me and a friend, uh, Bill Keyes, who ultimately became a general. And I will tell you about him later if you're interested. Bill called me and he said, um, in his own inevitable way, Walt, it's time for you to go overseas without your dependents. Where do you want to go? I said, well, what is there out there? He said, well, Okinawa. I said, no, I'm not going to Okinawa. He said, you can go back to Vietnam as an advisor. I said, OK, sign me up. Um, maybe he didn't give that enough thought, but you know, it seemed like the thing that I really should do. Um, my family never really understood that decision. And now looking back, I, I can understand why. Their thought was, as they've discussed it with me since then, was you'd already been. You know, you'd already left us. You'd survived a tour in Vietnam. Why would you go back? But it was what I did, and it was who I was. So that's how I ended up there the second time. And ultimately, Bill Keyes assigned himself there. Mm -hmm. So we were there together. So he understood what you were doing. He understood. <laughs> and the group of people that were there had all volunteered to go back. So it was a group uh, that I knew. I knew most of the people that were there as advisors. And they were people that I held in high esteem. The term advisors, we're hearing that now yeah. with uh, the people that are being sent to Iraq to assist with the Peshmerga right. and, and other sorts of things. Yeah. Some people see that as truly advising and not being directly involved in the combat. Others think it's just code words. What does it really mean? It's code word. You cannot advise without becoming a, you, you can't be a real advisor without begin, being involved in combat. How can you do that? You're going you're gonna to tell people what to do day after day after day, and then when they go off to fight, you're not going? Come on. It's, uh, of course, they're involved. And we're beginning to see that they are involved. Uh, and it, it can become very dangerous, of course, as we are also seeing. Uh, but there were, no, there were no code words then for us. We were advisors. We lived with them. We lived with them. Uh, and there were only two Americans with this battalion, uh, myself and, uh, and a captain. I was a major at the time. And when they fought, we fought. We gave the best advice that we could. They had had Marine advisors for over a decade, so these guys were pretty good. In fact, some of them were real good. And in many cases, what they really needed us for was to be able to get close air support for them and, and artillery support and naval gunfire support. But um, we had a good relationship with, our, with the people that we were advising. And the, the difference then, uh, uh, between then and now, is that we never, we worried about a lot of things but we never worried about one of them turning on us. We were loyal to them and they were loyal to us. Um, but we became ultimately involved in the, in the Easter Offensive, which uh, was a real, a real battle. Let's talk about that when we come back. Okay. We're talking with General Walt Boomer on Veterans Chronicles. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by retired Marine Corps General Walt Boomer, veteran of Vietnam and the commander of Marine Ground Forces in the first Gulf War. Sir, just before the break, you were talking about how on your second tour in Vietnam in an advisory capacity, you ended up in a major uh, conflict with the enemy as well. Right. That, that conflict, Greg, uh, came to be called the Easter Offensive because they attacked on Easter. Um, Multi-division North Vietnamese Army attack. But let me go back and sort of set the stage for you, because most of the U.S. grand forces had pulled out. Marines had essentially gone back home, went to Okinawa. Um, and the only people there, generally speaking, were advisors. So the Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese, were, in essence, on their own. Um, they could not control all of the territory that we had been able to control when the U.S. forces were there. So they had pulled back from west to east and up in the northwestern corner, up near the DMZ, 
we were manning a series of outposts, um, but they were the far western outposts at the time. They were the hilltops that we were sitting on. And my battalion was on an old Army firebase called Firebase Sarge. Um, and the battalion had been divided in half. My assistant, uh, wonderful gent named Ray Smith, who later became a general officer, was with the other half of the battalion on a little hill called Nui Bajo. So we were, in essence, about a thousand meters apart, up sitting on top of the hill, overlooking the west towards Quezon. And as time as and as we were there, over time we began to see a buildup. I mean, it was evident that they were something was going on out there. I remember a South Vietnamese general flew in one day, and I took him up to the edge, and I said, "Here's what I'm seeing." And I said, "We need to spoil this attack now before it begins." And his answer was, "Well, we really something like we really don't have the strength." to do that. And quite frankly, knowing what was out there, they didn't. Um, anyhow, we watched this build up, and then uh, on Easter, 1972, it began with uh, a tremendous rocket and artillery attack right on our position, both on mine and on Captain Smith's. I was in communication, radio communication with him. We were talking through this as we were getting the hell beat out of us, and, and taking casualties slowly but surely from this rocket on artillery fire. In fact, I had a rocket come right through my bunker. I, I don't know. You know, sometimes you wonder how these things happen, but apparently not fused correctly. Came through the top of the bunker, down into the dirt floor of the bunker. And the hole is about this big, the, the rocket's about like this and then detonated there, and the explosive force came back up. I, didn't, I wasn't scratched. But that's how intense that fire was. Um, so I'm talking to Smith, and finally at some point during the night, he said, uh, we essentially have been overrun. He said, there are North Vietnamese soldiers all around me, literally. Um, so he picked up his counterpart, the person he was advising, saved his life, picked him up, put him on his shoulder, and got through their defensive wire going back the other way. Uh, I didn't know this at the time. I, I thought that's the last conversation I'll, I'll ever have with Smith. Mm -hmm. um, later on that evening, uh, well, we had two young Army soldiers with us during doing secret stuff. They weren't part of my unit at all. Their bunker took a direct hit, and I crawled out to see if I could help them, and they, they sadly uh, were killed instantly by the explosion into their bunker. But I don't know what time it was, probably after midnight, I said to my counterpart, the person I was advising, look, we can't hold this hill. We need to come off, regroup, fight again another day. And he said, uh, my general tells me we must stay. And I said, I tell you what, you can stay, I'm not staying. So he comes back again about 30 minutes later and he said, we go now. <laughs> so we came off that hill in the darkness bringing a column of wounded with us. Um, and then for the next three days, two days, um, tried to make our way back east to where there were additional Vietnamese Marine forces that we could link up with. Um, everywhere we turned, there were North Vietnamese. We, we finally were almost out, and, um, and, they, and they found us and attacked again. And then for the first time, the South Vietnamese Marines cracked. They had held up really well, really courageously and bravely, but this sort of was the last straw. And they were flowing by me like uh, salmon coming up a stream. <laughs> and I was hollering at them to 
Now the officers could speak English. The the you know the, the enlisted Vietnamese Marines couldn't. I was hollering at them to stop because I knew they were going to leave this column of wounded. Anyhow, um, they didn't, and the word in Vietnamese for advisor is Kovan. And pretty soon after I had been yelling at them to stop, I began to hear Kovan, Kovan over here, and I knew it was the North Vietnamese. And, and they really wanted to capture one of us. And I said, you know, I'm out of here. So I picked up a couple of lieutenants who were with me and we, we managed to make it out. And we made it out of the jungle through the Piedmont, well off the hilltop through the jungle into the, what is the Piedmont section, hilly but not so many trees, back to a fire base, um, which was still intact and still functioning. It was a Vietnamese artillery base with Marine advisors there, of course. And as I approached that fire base on a little hilltop to the outside, uh, here stands Ray Smith. He had survived. So we had a little reunion there and uh, talked about what needed to be done. I was pretty exhausted. He had had a day to recover. And I told the advisor inside, a gentleman by the name of Jim Joy, who ultimately went on to become a general officer too, wonderful guy. I said, Jim, you've got to come out of here. You, we can't stay. We need to go back to, fall back to Quang Tri, regroup, and then we'll be able to fight these guys off. But right now, we can't. So that night, they came out. Um, I, was, uh, I was just physically beat. So I tied myself to Ray Smith, and he sort of drugged me out that night to the next morning when we were picked up and made it back to safety. But there was another event that went on that has been written about. Um, while we were making that trek from west to east, the North Vietnamese armor was coming down north to south. And they approached a bridge on the Quang Tri River. And a fellow advisor named John Ripley single-handedly crawled out on underneath that bridge under fire, and he blew it up, blew the bridge. Without a doubt, we would have been cut off had he not done that. Wow. Um, wonderful guy, obviously. Yeah. Um, so we made it back to Quang Tri and, and, did, uh, and, then, and then did hold. Once we could consolidate again, we, we, we held them off, and it stopped that. Well, they ultimately took Quang Tri City, but we took it back and held, and it stopped them uh, for a couple of years. Of course, and three years later, they came back and took the country. But right. uh, it was an interesting battle, at any rate. Last, a couple of questions on Vietnam. Your reaction, first of all, when Saigon fell? Um, my sense was that it was probably that they were not going to be able to withstand um, the North Vietnamese for forever, so I wasn't totally surprised, but saddened and disappointed. Then, in addition to the frustrations of what was happening in Vietnam, there's what was happening here, and that was the treatment of American soldiers at the time in a way that's unfathomable to people today. Yes. Did you personally experience that? You know, I was very lucky. I People tell stories of coming back and being spit on. I didn't experience that. Um, but nevertheless, we knew that there was no support, or seemed to be no support for the war. Um, and of course, it was patently unfair. Not, you, you could either support the war or not support it. But to not support the troops who were being ordered to go there and who carried out their orders and who performed with great courage and, and, uh, and dignity and perseverance to disrespect them uh, was simply wrong, S simply wrong. And of course, I think the nation began to reflect on that and said, 
yeah, we, we agree, that wasn't right. These young men, 55,000 more or less killed, 250-some thousand wounded, um, they didn't ask to go, unless it was your profession. I asked to go back the second time, but these youngsters didn't ask to go. They went and they, and they were really terrific. General, we'll pause right there. When we come back, we'll talk about the Gulf War. This is Veterans Chronicles on the Radio American Network. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by retired Marine Corps General Walt Boomer, the commander of Marine Ground Forces in the Gulf War, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, sir, you were, of course, commissioned as a second lieutenant coming out of ROTC, but you were ultimately elevated to the rank of one-star general, brigadier general, in the mid-1980s. Right. Explain what that moment was like and what your responsibilities were. Well, I think most Marines and probably most soldiers and sailors and airmen, when they're selected for general officer, they think, holy cow, how did it happen to me? Because what you realize is that as you look around amongst your colleagues, you say, that guy's, or that gal, they're smarter than I am. I, how did I happen to be selected and they weren't? So I, it was sort of a feeling of, God, I got struck by lightning. But I'm glad I did. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that, uh, that I was selected. Then you were promoted multiple times after that in a fairly short yeah. period of time, which brings us to August 2nd, 1990. And that's when Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. Obviously, right. you didn't know exactly what the president's response would be in the instant that news was breaking. But what were you thinking? Well, I was transitioning to take over the command of the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force in Camp Pendleton. And my wife and I were driving cross country, moving two cars. She was in the car ahead of me with a friend and I was following. And during that transit somewhere in Texas, moving from New Orleans to California, I heard on the radio that uh, Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. Um, I was out of touch, really. I had no intelligence about anything that was going on. So when I linked up with them that evening at the place we were staying, I said, did uh, you guys hear the news? No, what news? I said, well, Iraq invaded Kuwait. And my wife looked at me and she said, what does that mean? <laughs> um, I had an inkling, but you know, I said, I don't know yet. Let's proceed on. So we arrived at Camp Pendleton. I don't remember the day. Uh, and nine days later, uh, I was in Saudi Arabia. Wow. Yeah, it wasn't just a few days that yeah. Desert Shield got I, I, lost, I, right? Yeah, I assumed command and, in essence, left. And took with me um, not very many people in the beginning. Uh, we deployed uh, a brigade out of 29 Palms. Uh, they were ready to go and uh, really were in a defensive position in the, in, in the beginning and in a defensive mindset because we were terribly outnumbered by the Iraqis. And as we thought about it, it seemed to us that the next logical move on the part of, part of Hussein would be to come on down the east coast of Saudi Arabia and take those oil fields, that whole oil manufacturing producing sector. I mean, it was right there for him. Mm -hmm. um, he, he paused. Uh, and that was a big mistake on his part. Uh, so we began to, to build up that uh, defensive position until it became pretty obvious that he couldn't, he couldn't do it. As our air power built and our ground uh, power began to grow stronger and stronger each day. So I ultimately ended up with 92,000 Marines, both air and ground. Um, and I was dual-hatted, I guess, of Marine Corps jargon. I had both the operational piece of the Marine Corps, and I was also commanding General, General Marine's Central Command. So 
Of course, General Schwarzkopf was my immediate boss, and he was operating out of Riyadh. Uh, but the buildup went uh, went smoothly. It it went as we had had hoped it would go, and as we had prepared for. Um, and then pretty soon we were there in force. Uh, in fact, uh, we didn't know it, but in overwhelming force. Um, so we began to train immediately for the attack into Kuwait. Now, the Marines were positioned just south of Kuwait. Um, I think General Schwarzkopf's thought in the beginning, as he began to formulate his plan, was that we would sort of create a diversion along the Kuwaiti border, and General Frank's corps would come around from, um, from the west. Uh, but I told General Schwarzkopf, look, we're not you don't have this Marine Force here to create a diversion. We, we are going to liberate Kuwait. That, that's what we're going to do. And he said, okay. And he, in essence, gave me that mission. Um, now, we didn't see eye to eye on everything. Uh, interesting guy to work for, but uh, General Schwarzkopf gave me a mission and then let me alone to accomplish it, and I'll always appreciate that. Um, so we began to plan for this attack into Kuwait. Um, weren't really sure how the hell we were going to do it, because they, they had created a, a formidable barrier along the Kuwait border. Minefields, berms, um, a lot of propaganda on their part about burning oil that they were going to set on fire if somebody tried to come across, uh, which we didn't pay too much attention to. But we, we began to refine our training in terms of, of breaching this, this barrier. It wasn't something that we had done, really, in, in our training. And we didn't have all the equipment that we needed, either. But uh, the training began to go on. The 1st Marine Division was there early on joined by the second, led by General Bill Keyes, the guy that had sent me to Vietnam earlier. So then I had two divisions and Bill began to go to work. And our plan envisioned an attack, envisioned an attack by one division followed by the other. Wasn't really happy with that. Um, later on, as, as training continued. In fact, it was getting late, uh, according to the president's timetable, which I, I know now. Um, I said, Bill, he came to me and said, you know, I don't, I don't like this plan very much. I said, I don't either. You know, we've worked on it, worked on it. I said, but uh, you haven't been here that long. Can you conduct that breach? Can you conduct that breach? And he said, yes, I can. So I said, OK, we'll change the plan. So at the last moment, we, we changed the plan that involved a huge logistics effort. I, I don't even know today, thinking back, how these Marines managed to move hundreds of thousands of tons of ammunition, equipment, water, et cetera, from where we had planned to where the new plan uh, envisioned us going. But we pulled it off, and I went to General Schwarzkopf and told him I wanted to change the plan, and he backed me up. He came back to Washington and said, Boomer wants another three days, and explained why, and everyone agreed. So when we attacked into Kuwait, we attacked with two divisions abreast instead of one following, um, and it was, it was successful. One of the things that people have often talked about is the feigned amphibious assault. Um, talk about, I've read a little bit about how that was originally going to really happen. Yeah. And uh, ultimately, it was decided that it was mainly to draw yeah. the Republican Guard yeah, there. And it, then you guys it's sort of an interesting smashing. story because, you know, we do uh, have a history of coming from the sea. So there was 
the Gulf and why not come from the sea? And we looked at it, began to study it. And in our original plan, uh, we were going to attack with this one division. And there was an, uh, uh, a Marine Brigade aboard ship. And they were going to conduct an amphibious operation. And we were going to link up. Looked pretty good as we began to lay it all out on the sand table. It, it was really kind of complicated. Um, but then a couple of things happened. I got another division on the ground, so doubled in size uh, on the ground in Saudi Arabia. And you may recall that two Navy ships were hit by mines in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. uh, neither of them were sunk. Thankfully, I think, due to the great uh, work the sailors did. But here are two ships, two major Navy combatant ships struck by mines. So this now is on the mind of General Stan Arthur, who's going to conduct this amphibious operation, and on mine as well, and on Schwarzkopf's. Um, So we began to wonder if it was really the thing that we wanted to do. Now, there was some pressure from Washington, headquarters Marine Corps, to conduct an amphibious operation. Uh, but I had told General Schwarzkopf the first day I met him, first time I had, had ever met him was there in Saudi Arabia. And I said, General, I will never recommend an amphibious operation to you simply because I'm a Marine and that's what we think we ought to do. I will only do that at if I think it will help us accomplish the mission. And I want you to know that. And I, I think he believed that. So as, as planning went on and, and as time for the attack grew closer, we had a meeting aboard the Blue Ridge, uh, Admiral Arthur's flagship, General Schwarzkopf, in, in essence me, and, and Stan Arthur. And we had been clearing mines that the Navy had slow process. Um, anyhow, General Schwarzkopf wanted to know how long it was going to take, and Stan told him, and he didn't like what he heard, because that was just extending this whole thing longer than we wanted it to go. And then he said, well, what, are you going to do any collateral damage to Kuwait City? I'm paraphrasing his question, but that in essence was what it was. And we said, probably, because we're not going to let these Marines go ashore without preparing it, so there's going to be collateral damage. And, and uh, he said, well, we have managed thus far to keep Kuwait City um, free of damage. We haven't attacked it by air. I don't, I don't want to destroy that city in order to liberate it. And he looked down the table at me and he said, Walt, he said, can you accomplish your mission without the amphibious operation? And I said, uh, yes, sir, I can. But there's almost an entire Iraqi division along this coastline thinking that we're going to conduct an amphibious operation. I don't want them turning to the west and having to face them as we attack into Kuwait from the south. So we need to make them believe that we are truly going to conduct an amphibious operation. And that's how the feint came into being. They executed it really well. And it held that entire division on the coast until we attacked and they began to run away. In terms of protecting Kuwait City, uh, was that something that everyone pretty much agreed on or was that frustrating because it was this thing you had to do in addition to accomplishing the mission? You know, I, I don't think we... Uh, were bothered by that. Um, we, we felt that we could liberate Kuwait and not destroy Kuwait City. I, I think that was sort of the general belief. Okay. And, and I'm glad that we uh, felt that way. Now at the time, uh, there was some concern about the proficiency of the Iraqi army. I think at the time, some, someone said they were the fourth most uh, yeah. proficient army in the world. And of course, you knew well that they had weapons of mass destruction, given that the Kurds had been gassed just a couple of years earlier. How did yeah. that factor into your calculations? Well, uh, you're, you're absolutely correct about their numbers. We, we were outnumbered. 
people tend to lose sight of that. But there were, there were more Iraqis in, in Kuwait than, than I had Marines. Uh, they had a uh, tremendous number of artillery pieces. I mean, it was a well-equipped army, and they had just fought a war mm -hmm. with Iran. Right. Um, so in the beginning, we, we thought, wow, this is going to be a really tough battle. Um, and the whole chemical warfare issue was in the forefront of our minds. It's the thing that kept me awake at, at night because as we punched through these barriers, we were going to, it was going to slow us down. We had to clear the minefields and we would have been a perfect target for a chemical attack at that point. Um, so we didn't know. But I had, I, I was interviewed you know, on numerous occasions by, by the press, and they would always ask me this question. I mean, these men and women were, were with us, so they knew what the heck was going on. Well, what are you, you going to do if they attack you with chemical weapons? And I made this up. I mean, it was, in essence, a lie. I said, they're not going to. Well, how do you know that? I said, because they know we will destroy them if they launch that kind of an attack. Um, then something happened that uh, gave me a little bit of pause and, and a little bit of uh, hope. We captured uh, an Iraqi major who was a chemical officer and interrogated him and he said, uh, we're not going to use these weapons. Why not? Because I think my family would be destroyed in Baghdad if we, if we do. Well, interestingly enough, 20 years later, I was with um, President Bush Sr. and his senior cabinet, and I was talking to Secretary Baker, who I admire a lot, and I was telling him this story. And he, he said to me in his Texas drawl, he said, well, Walt, that's exactly what I told him. He had had told the foreign minister that if they use chemical weapons, it would be the end of their nation. So I said, well, thanks very much. <laughs> appreciate that a lot. So anyhow, once we were through that barrier and they had not used them, we took off our chemical suits. We attack in chemical suits. They're not comfortable. They're hot. They're heavy. Um, but we, we didn't know, and I wasn't sure until we had broken through that they probably weren't going to use them. And, and they didn't. Now, because we were on edge, we had all sorts of chemical alarms. And you have, you have Marines today who will tell you that they think they were subjected to chemicals. They weren't. I can assure them that they weren't. Now, whether or not later there were some chemical dumps blown up and, and maybe some of that escaped, I, I, I don't know. But we were not subjected to a chemical attack. What were your first observations of the enemy once there was finally contact? Well, we, we'd begun to make contact, you know, prior to the main attack. And they had begun to surrender, come across through the minefield to us in increasing numbers. And it, it was becoming pretty obvious that these were dispirited guys. Um, they really weren't sure why they had attacked another uh, Islamic nation, why they'd taken it over. They obviously had doubts about whether or not their officers were going to be there with them if we attacked. Because by now, air power was beginning to erode their morale and destroy their capability. So as more and more of them began, began to come over, um, I'm beginning to think, you know, they may not be as tough as we thought they were going to be. And then they attacked into Saudi Arabia. They attacked a, a town up in the northeast corner called Kafji. Um, a major attack at that time, although I actually didn't regard it at that, as that. I, I didn't know how much... Uh, 
faith they had put in their ability to take Kafji and, and how, much, how many resources they had devoted to it. I knew they could, I knew they could take the town, but they, weren't, they couldn't advance any farther. I mean, if they tried to advance along that coastline, that we were going to destroy them. Anyhow, we defeated them at Kafji. We, in essence, allowed our, our Saudi partners to play the major role in that battle, backed them up with air and Marines. Um, and the Iraqis were defeated. And as I watched them, it became pretty obvious to me, if you bloodied their nose really hard during round one, they were reluctant to come out for round two. So as all of those pieces began to come together, I became more confident that our attack was going to be successful. Does it bother you in any way that because it was a relatively short operation that people think it was an easy operation? <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't reflect on that too much, but um, the only thing about that that bothers me is is that they feel, maybe some people feel that because it was short, you know, the, the troops that were involved really didn't have much to do and it was just a piece of cake. It wasn't just a piece of cake. Uh, we had a great plan, that plan was executed well, and the Marines and soldiers executed that plan well. But I tell people, I want you to think about what this young Marine on the ground faced. Uh, as he attacked, he, he found Iraqis everywhere as, as we were trying to kill them. My estimate is that about 75% of them decided they wanted to give up. 25% didn't want to give up and continued to fight. So here's a 19-year-old Marine faced with this dilemma. He knows he's not supposed to kill people that are surrendering, mm -hmm. yet he's got people shooting at him. They, they handle that so magnificently. They took in those that wanted to surrender and they killed those who wanted to fight. Uh, we captured, in the Marine sector alone, 22,000 Iraqis. Think about that. 22,000 POWs we had within two days. Um, and to my knowledge, to this day, there was not a single atrocity committed by any of these young Marines. I mean, they, they just performed wonderfully, as did their soldier counterparts out to the West. So um, I, I understand why, because it only lasted three days. People say, well, you know, it's a piece of cake. It was a piece of cake. We didn't think it was going to be a piece of cake. But our troops were just so much better, so much better. And we had them there in the right numbers and in the right mix. And, and the whole operation, the whole campaign came together so well. Air, Air Power did uh, just an unbelievable job in terms of, of making it easier for us as we attack. Um, everybody played a critical role. Just a few more questions with you. General Boomer, uh, uh, we mentioned your promotion of Brigadier General back in the 80s. What we didn't mention was in the communications. Uh, position uh, with the Marine Corps. The Gulf War was the first war to really be covered 24-7 yes. on television. CNN was, was right there and we remember many of us who are old enough uh, that first night and Bernie Shaw and Peter Arnett and, right. Uh, right there in the Al Rashid Hotel. But it was the, kind of the dawn of the cable news era. We didn't have the internet era yet. Right. Um, so how did that change the way the war was presented and articulated, and was it easier that it didn't happen now when there's just nonstop internet chatter and so forth? Uh, it, it really was uh, not a revolution, but an evolution in terms of the way we worked with the media. And, you know, during that period of time, we began to embed uh, reporters with the units. Now, it had been done. I'd had reporters with me in Vietnam. I mean, they were fantastic people. I thought they had more courage than they had brains. But uh, this was the first time that we had really had reporters with us and had kept them with us so that they could get to understand and appreciate who these young men and women were who were fighting this war. 
and my philosophy, uh, and General Schwarzkopf and I didn't totally agree on this, but uh, my philosophy was let turn them loose, turn the media loose. Do you run the risk of some Marine who's mad at his first sergeant that afternoon saying something he shouldn't say? Sure. But the rest of the stories that are going to be told to the reporters are going to be ones that need to get back home, need to get back home to parents whose sons and daughters are there. So we had a very liberal um, approach to the reporters that were with us, and it worked. We got, it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't great press that we were looking for. We just wanted honest coverage, which we got, and we wanted, I wanted for the American people to know, in my case, what these Marines were doing. And I think it worked. Um, it's a little more difficult today, I think, with all of the communications capability that we, that we have. But um, <laughs> I had a reporter from the Washington Post with me named Molly Moore who went with me with my command post into the attack. I followed right behind Bill Key's division. I had asked four others to come. Um, Molly was the only one that accepted. I think the others didn't think they were going to get to see much with the MEF headquarters. And some had a commitment. So Molly got the story. And uh, she wrote what she wrote. Occasionally she'd get a little frustrated because I I wanted, because then we were actually in battle, and I wanted to, not that I didn't, I trusted her completely, but I didn't want her to say something because she didn't know exactly what we were doing that was wrong. So she'd get a little frustrated with me because I wanted to take a look at our story because before she submitted it. But we had a great working relationship, and, and we really, in the middle of combat, did everything we could to help her get that story out. One of the things that certainly came out of uh, the Gulf War was uh, appreciation uh, for what seemed to be a very effective and competent chain of command from the President on down to Secretary Cheney and General Powell and Schwarzkopf and on down to you and your colleagues. Was it that way? Uh, it, was, it was exactly that way. We had, I think, um, it was the best team we've had in, in decades. Uh, the president was wise and experienced, uh, had been in combat himself. His key cabinet officials were, were good men. Cheney was a good secretary of defense. Um, he would listen to you, argue with you, uh, but ultimately, ultimately would listen. And he, he did what we suggested to him that we should do. Baker, a great Secretary of Defense, that whole team, Colin Powell, fantastic chairman, um, and it worked. And you, you, if you're going to commit young Americans to war, you need that kind of wisdom and leadership at the top guiding them strategically. Last question, what did it mean to you to see the young men in that conflict, even before the conflict started, get the appreciation of the American yeah. people, and especially when they came home. It was truly, truly heartwarming. Uh, the American people turned out. There were parades everywhere. But just one quick story. We were in Dallas at a parade. I was walking down the street because I was going to lead the Marines, and I ran into Mr. Ross Perot. I knew Perot, had great respect for him then and now, and he said in his southern drawl, General, come over here, I want you to meet these Vietnam veterans that I have. I said, well, Mr. Perot, uh, you know I'm a Vietnam veteran, but the parade is about to start, and I've got to get to the down here where I'm supposed to be. And he looked at me and he said, hail, General. This parade ain't going to start until I tell it to. <laughs> I said, okay. But 
we were all gathered then together in this huge auditorium. I don't remember where it was in Dallas. A whole block of Vietnam veterans who'd never received any thanks. When they were introduced, every one of these youngsters from Desert Shield, Desert Storm stood up and applauded these Vietnam veterans. It was a really special moment for me. General, thank you for your incredible service to our country. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Been here with retired U.S. Marine Corps General Walt Boomer, Commander of Marine Ground Forces in the Gulf War, veteran of Vietnam. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.